contrary to most of the other archaeologists <coughs> present uh, in, on this meeting, uh, I have no field experience in the Levant uh, or uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. My uh, fieldwork experience is basically uh, in Upper Mesopotamia, so in uh, terms of the 13th and 12th century BC would be uh, Middle Assyria. However, I will not going to talk to you about uh, Middle Assyria. Uh, the next lecture will deal at least with the uh, uh, Middle Euphrates Valley, but uh, I will talk about the Amuk region, which is uh, here um, in cultural terms uh, in the northwest of Syria, in political terms today uh, in southern Turkey. Uh, the Amuk is a plain uh, of uh, roughly 50 by 50 kilometers at the north, northernmost tip of the Orontes Valley. Uh, it's a very fertile plain um, which uh, until the 1930s uh, partly was covered by a lake and swamps. Uh, you see on this map still the lake which is not uh, actually no longer there. Uh, so parts of the plain were not uh, usable for habitation, but uh, the rest attracted uh, human settlement very early on. Um, and you can see here on this uh, picture taken from the Amanus mountain range down to the Amok Valley, the northern part of it, that it's a very densely uh, inhabited region and it had been uh, since uh, thousands of years. Archaeological excavation uh, in the Amok region uh, mainly took part uh, in, uh, let's say, two um, spans of time. Uh, the first was in the 1930s when an uh, expedition of the University of Chicago, the so-called Syro-Hittite expedition uh, led by Robert Braidwood, <coughs> Um, worked uh, on several sites in the Amut region. They uh, were active at the same time uh, as the, the other expedition, also from Chicago, whose aim was to create a chronology for third millennium Mesopotamia. And the Syro-Hittite expedition had a similar uh, goal to create a chronology for, for Syria based uh, on uh, stratigraphic observations for that aim. Uh, they worked at several uh, sites, mainly three uh, sites in the Amok Valley uh, with excavation. Um, with uh, the beginning of the Second World War, uh, archaeology, archaeological excavation in that region stopped and was not uh, reopened in a larger scale until the 1990s when Chicago came back with a project led by Astahan Jenner, the Amuk Valley Regional Project. They started with a survey and some other uh, work, and uh, this ended in an excavation, a renewed excavation, at the important site of Alalach, um, which is, however, not of particular importance uh, to us now, since uh, this settlement declined very much uh, already during the late Bronze Age and uh, was abandoned at about 1200. More interesting for us is the Tel Tainat, which is actually only a few hundred meters apart from Alalacha project, directed by uh, Timothy Harrison from the University of Toronto since 2004. And I must confess, my um, link to all these missions is indirect. I had been working on the terracotta material from uh, the earliest, the Braidwood uh, expedition, and I have not been a collaborator of uh, the modern um, Chicago or Toronto projects. Nevertheless, I hope uh, if uh, some of the, some people of the Taina mission would be here, they would at least recognize their results uh, in my presentation. Um, the um, what the Amex Syro Hittite expedition did, and which is still in use, is creating a uh, chronology of faces uh, for the Amok, and the faces which are interesting for us are mainly face 
N, uh, which covers the, what is generally called in Near Eastern terms, uh, the early Iron Age, Iron Age 1. Uh, it's preceded by phase M, the late Bronze Age, and uh, succeeded by phase O, uh, Iron Age 2. Um, the sites which are interesting for us are Chatelhu and uh, Tainat, um, where uh, there are, uh, this is from the um, Toronto uh, expedition, which uh, they have uh, four levels on a small scale but uh, well stratified uh, excavation. Uh, these levels are the old uh, excavations in Chatalhu. Uh, and what I uh, show you here uh, is the, uh, partly the result of uh, Marina Pucci's rework on the Chatalhu material. As I said, I, uh, my, my original starting point for dealing with the Amuk region in that uh, particular um, time period were the terracotta figurines. In the late Bronze Age, uh, the uh, terracotta figurines in Syria were nearly all uh, mold-made. This technique has replaced the handmade figurines at the end of the Middle Bronze Age, and uh, the vast majority of terracotta figurines from late Bronze Age Syria look like this. Uh, they, they show uh, nude women holding their breasts, uh, and they are very similar all over um, Syria. Um, and uh, if you look at the distribution map, you can see that the Amok region here, uh, in, in this respect, and this is also true for many other respects, uh, was during the Bronze Age uh, part of an inner Syrian cultural region. Uh, the Amok is not far apart from the sea, something like 20 kilometers. There's even uh, in the valley of the Orontes, a very easy path to the Mediterranean. Nevertheless, the region was uh, culturally seen from the material culture inland uh, oriented. Um, and, however, at the end of the late Bronze Age, some uh, strange uh, kind types and of figurines do appear. Um, the left one is partly mold made, so the uh, the, the body is mold made, but the face was uh, added uh, by hand, a very strange technique. And the right uh, example is also from Chatelhu. It's completely handmade, but it is uh, imitating a mold made figurine, uh, which is a strange uh, incident since uh, a mold is not a very uh, sophisticated technology. Uh, but obviously, at that moment, for the use of this particular um, plaque, uh, he, he or she wants to make something which looks like a, a mold-made plaque, but had no mold available. Um, for this kind of uh, figuring, I do not have any parallels from other sites. Um, at least from, from the terracotta perspective, it's a sign that something strange uh, was going on. However, uh, the rest of the terracotta material from Amuk Face and the early Iron Age uh, is, is different. So, so this is a, um, just a slide to show you that after the early Iron Age, the Iron Age II, uh, the mold made technique came back. Uh, the, the figurines do not look exactly the same as the late Bronze Age, but they are similar. They're obviously, there is a tradition which is going on, but however was in some way interrupted uh, for uh, probably two or three centuries. Uh, and in the uh, later Iron Age, um, the figurines are also um, distributed uh, along the coast. However, the, uh, the other early Iron Age figurines uh, are of a completely different tradition. Uh, I can show you only um, fragmented pieces here from the Amok, one from Chatterhug and one from Tel Judeida. Uh, these are figurines in a uh, Mycenaean tradition of the uh, Psi or Fi figurines. Uh, and uh, the right one 
was obviously attached to the rim of the vessel, uh, and this one probably too, since it has a very small hole, which is unfortunately not visible on this of this on this photo. Uh, but it obviously is a very similar um, arrangement as with uh, the, these famous um, Perati uh, vessel uh, found in a, in a tomb in Perati in Greece. Um, and um, the other um, piece from Tel Jodeda uh, can be compared to uh, Palestinian uh, examples also of the early Iron Age, like this one from uh, Tel Aitun. Um, and uh, these are obviously um, figurines uh, in, a, in a Western uh, tradition. Um, and there are other uh, figurines in the uh, Amuk in the Iron Age, which also have no predecessors uh, whatsoever in, uh, in Bronze Age Syria. These are figurines like this, handmade, um, with a pierced um, headgear. Uh, and uh, two piercings uh, at the lower body. Uh, they seem to show males and actually not really found together, but in the same levels are a lot of uh, single legs with piercings and it's uh, very likely uh, to <coughs> assume that these the legs and the figurines belong together, even uh, though the original excavators do not recognize this and, and Right leg amulet uh, on the on the on the fine notes, uh, and uh, for this kind of figurines, there are uh, the best parallels also in the West. This is a, uh, a a figurine from the National Museum of Cyprus in Nicosia. There is no uh, provenance given for this figurine, but there are others not that well preserved. Uh, from controlled excavations of early Iron Age in Cyprus uh, and also in, um, in mainland Greece. Um, this is also a, a tradition which has no predecessors in Syria and I was not able to find um, really comparable pieces uh, on, the, uh, on the Syrian mainland. Uh, another a uh, group of uh, objects now going for personal ornaments, uh, fibulae, uh, also have clearly Western connections. Um, in uh, Chatalhuri, uh, a fragment of a violin uh, bow shaped fibula was found. The fibula uh, invented somewhere in the uh, central Mediterranean in the middle of the second uh, millennium. Uh, did not reach the Near East uh, before the early Iron Age. It probably appeared already in the 13th century in a few examples in Cyprus. And uh, this is the earliest type actually present um, in, uh, in the Near East. And Stefania surely will recognize the, this example from Tel Aviv. Uh, and uh, this is from uh, Inkomi um, in Cyprus. Um, Pede, who has worked on the Fibre, uh, draw this uh, distribution map for this particular type. Uh, so in Cyprus, in uh, the northern Levant, and one piece uh, further inland in Tel Lida. Um, and this is another uh, early Fibre type, um, probably uh, 11th century. Um, which uh, also is distributed in uh, Cyprus and uh, the Near East, however, also in uh, Palestine. Uh, and uh, Pede draws this map uh, of his early fibule, which means a fibule from the 12th and 11th century. Um, this uh, map was drawn in the 1990s, it probably can be um, correct a little bit, but uh, it's an obvious picture uh, that uh, we have these early uh, fibula in Cyprus, in Cilicia, the northern Levant, and then again uh, in the uh, uh, central area of Palestine, along the coast, but also a bit inland. Um, and I will come back to this uh, picture 
um, at the end. Of course, uh, pottery is uh, also probably the most uh, important uh, argument uh, on uh, Western influence. Uh, already, the Braidwood expedition excavated uh, uh, several um, pottery shirts and examples in a, a Mycenaean style. Uh, they were published, but it was always the question uh, how frequent are they actually uh, in the Amok region, and they were rarely used uh, in, uh, in the scientific discussion because this uh, was not clear. Uh, with the renewed excavation of uh, Tel Tainat, however, it is clear that this pottery is in the Amok region really uh, very frequent. I show you from the, this is from the brand new publication by Brian Janeway, um, in uh, several uh, pieces uh, of uh, Skifoy and other bowls from the earliest uh, Iron Age phase in Tel Tainat. Uh, they uh, do have uh, good parallels in uh, LH3C uh, material in the uh, in the Greek mainland and the again islands, basically, uh, obviously, in the middle and late um, LH3C, so not at the very beginning. Uh, this is uh, also true for other types of um, pottery. I can show you this uh, fora uh, from Teltainer, one of the few uh, complete examples from this, as I said, uh, excavation on a very limited space. Uh, uh, which has uh, good parallels again uh, in uh, this is the one from Mycenae again uh, and uh, the parallels also of course include uh, craters here I have uh, comparison to the one from Taipana uh, two pieces uh, from uh, or not one piece from uh, Tel Aviv um, again um, the um, Janeway published uh, this table which uh, gives the frequency of uh, this material in the assemblages of Tel Tainat. Uh, it's uh, divided in three chronological groups and Tel Tainat is divided into a, uh, in what uh, Janeway calls Aegean style and a local style which is uh, very similar to the Aegean and uh, dependent from it. Uh, and uh, these two styles of decoration, both in the LH3C tradition, um, amount to, you can see, uh, roughly 50% um, of the material. So it's not uh, only a few shirts, but it's really a, a very substantial part uh, of the assemblages. And here it is compared to the um, frequencies of um, this kind of comparable kind of pottery uh, in uh, Philistine sites in Palestine, Ashdod, Tel Migne, Tel Kassile, uh, which are uh, obviously comparable. Um, according uh, to both Bucci and Janeway, uh, there are indications from photographic analysis that the initial phase of this pottery. Uh, was imported, uh, but uh, the main bark was uh, made from local place. Um, I uh, am not able to uh, uh, not able to see uh, the results myself, so I can only refer that. Um, but uh, it's uh, at least consistent with the results also from uh, the southern left. Um, and uh, contrary to the situation in the, uh, in the late Bronze Age, where uh, Mycenaean pottery was also distributed uh, in the lab, and you see here this general map uh, of, of a distribution of uh, late Atlantic 3B pottery. However, uh, the vast majority uh, is limited only to the coastal sites, and in the inland, you have uh, much less uh, Mycenaean material. Uh, there are some shirts, but these are 1%, 2% of the material, if not more. So this is really a, a very different picture um, in the uh, 12th and 11th century. Uh, we, yesterday we learned, at least I learned, uh, how important cooking 
uh, is and, and food and we also have a particular uh, before that not uh, um, attested type of uh, cooking pots so called well in, in southern level they would be called philistine cooking jugs um, in a very similar uh, way uh, present in Kainat also this uh, has um, um, pre uh, predecessors in the uh, Aegean region in the late Bronze Age. If we look at the development uh, of the, the sites, the architecture, we can um, probably the Chattel Hüvik is more um, gives, gives more information than Tel Taina, which are very limited, with a very limited exposure so far. This is the old Braidwood excavation. Uh, on the left, you see the general uh, excavation site. On the right, uh, the phase end, uh, which is uh, <coughs> tested at uh, several parts of the site. But also, you see it's, it's a very limited exposure. What is interesting is the city wall, uh, which obviously uh, was built in phase M, uh, and and uh, there are. It's not clear if there was a city wall before, but at least this one obviously was built in that period uh, and is definitely a, uh, a walled city of a uh, uh, certain um, extent. Um, if one tries to look on a more regional level, uh, not only the single sites, but how the whole Amok Plain was inhabited, one can of course look at the survey results. Braidwood conducted a survey in the 1930s and the uh, Amok Valley Regional Project conducted a second one, uh, now including also non-TEL sites uh, in the 1990s. This was, this was mainly done by Tony Wilkinson. Uh, and you see on the left Braidwood's uh, map and on the right Wilkinson's. Um, and um, both um, have um, uh, of course, uh, categorize the sites by, by periods. If we look at the, uh, the Braidwood um, expedition, uh, then uh, if you compare uh, period M, the late Bronze Age, with the early Iron Age and the later Iron Age, uh, it is visible. So the, the red dots are definitely attested sites and the pink dots are probably attested in that period, um, whatever that means. Um, and uh, <coughs> it obvious is that uh, the late Bronze Age uh, in that uh, expedition looks like a phase of a uh, very uh, limited uh, settlement uh, period uh, when the settlement density, at least looking at the number of sites, uh, reached a low. Uh, and then in the early Iron Age uh, increased. Uh, you see from 19 to 32 sites, 22 of them were settled at uh, places which were not uh, settled before. And then it continued into the later Iron Age where uh, most of the early Iron Age sites continued to be inhabited. Uh, this picture was also used by Janeway uh, here he compares Middle Bronze, Late Bronze and Early Iron Age uh, with the, uh, middle, the Late Bronze as, a, uh, as the lowest point, also uh, numbering the sites with Aegean pottery. Aegean pottery. Um, however, uh, the picture uh, becomes less clear if one... It, it's no wonder that Janeway used the old survey uh, results since the New survey results are much less uh, obvious, uh, and unfortunately, we uh, Tony Wilkinson is dead, and we cannot ask him anymore. Uh, however, um, I, I tend to believe that he done he done a, a good work, uh, and uh, according to him, the picture is much less obvious, uh, and there were more uh, settlements uh, in the late Bronze Age than with Braidwood, and less in the early Iron Age and also uh, a large degree of continuity between the late Bronze and the early Iron Age. Uh, so I uh, must confess that there are the pictures of the two surveys are indeed uh, not exactly consistent. 
Um, uh, but at least uh, it is clear that the early Iron Age is far away from being a, uh, a dark age in the sense of uh, 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 no settlements at all. Um, of course, um, the, uh, the question uh, is how to understand uh, in historical terms uh, what was uh, going on in the Northern Levant and uh, one very famous um, find or famous observation was made on the citadel of Aleppo. This is a picture taken in better times. Uh, this was excavated in the 1990s and the 2000s by a, a German expedition. They found the temple of the famous uh, storm god uh, of Aleppo, uh, which uh, is decorated uh, with uh, reliefs on the inside. Uh, and this is the main relief showing the, um, the owner of the temple, the storm god of Aleppo himself, <coughs> and opposite to him, uh, the a king. And even if you can uh, re rarely or hardly see anything, there is an inscription behind the figure of the king. And also here uh, in uh, hieroglyphic Luvian, uh, which reads Titus, king or hero, ruler of the land, well, what's written there is Patasatini. Uh, David Hawkins uh, wants to read this as Palestini, which is, of course, uh, very similar uh, to, to Palestine. Um, I um, actually realized that many philologists, I'm not one, uh, are a bit skeptical about this uh, reading and do not uh, by Hawkins' uh, reconstruction, but uh, even if you uh, do not accept this reconstruction of Palestini and uh, of an ethnonym uh, linked uh, to the, the palace shed in the south, uh, it's an obvious picture um, that uh, several developments in the northern Levant, and this includes the Amok region and uh, also uh, includes uh, the uh, the, the Ebla Plain and, and Tel Afis um, are similar and to a certain way uh, parallel uh, to uh, developments in the south uh, in, in, in Palestine. Uh, and um, in coming to the general question of this conference on migration, I think there, are, there is indeed a very good evidence that in the early Iron Age, um, there uh, was uh, some kind of migration. I do not think that the, uh, the, the original uh, population was completely replaced uh, by uh, other people, but obviously uh, the, a substantial um, immigration took part. Uh, if these people were forced to leave their original homes or not, I have no means uh, to say. Um, but of course, uh, since we can date the beginning of this uh, Western influence in the Amok region to around the mid 12th century, it is uh, tempting to link this uh, to the decline of uh, urban settlements in Cyprus during the 12th century. And uh, it is, uh, if one tries to uh, reconstruct uh, in historical term what was going on there. I would say it's the most likely um, reconstruction that people uh, from Cyprus with an uh, Aegean Western background settled uh, in the Amo country. Thank you for your attention.